Thank you all for coming uh, this afternoon. This workshop is called Empire of Chaos, a tutorial. Uh, my name is Bahram Zandi. I'm a co-chair, national co-chair of the Green Party US. And we have a, a panel of four speakers uh, the first one it would be me. Then uh, we have a professor from Washington on Skype joining us. Uh, he's a retired professor of Strayer University and also dean of the Strayer University, a uh, political scientist. And then we have two international speakers here from Chile and Venezuela that they will uh, talk about the latest events. And uh, after that, uh, we have discussion. So the first hour, I divi I'm dividing between four speakers, maybe about 15 minutes each, and then second hour for open discussions. So I start with my slides at this point. Okay, um, I will be using a lot of reference materials just to uh, use as, uh, for future references if you need to. Uh, I'm opening it with the name of the book by Noam Chomsky, Who Rules the World? So I think by the end of this workshop, you all will know who is ruling the world. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I, I start with this... Uh, uh, the concept of U.S. military bases that, if you can see, it is basically covering all over the, the, the Earth, the world. Um, this map is very important, but I don't know if all, you can all see it. It's very detailed, and it has all the location of U.S. military bases. It's about a thousand uh, military bases outside the U.S. So there, no country has such a, a posture in history or ever. Uh, there are little numbers that you can see by the names of the countries to see how many bases there are in each of these countries. I'll be glad to provide references for all these the resources for all these uh, uh, documents. Uh, it's not called uh, by some that uh, military bases are not a new imperialism. 95% of all military bases on other countries' soil are U.S. bases. So uh, Chalmers Johnson uh, says, uh, once upon a time you could trace the spread of imperialism by counting up colonies. America's version of the colony is the military base. Now these are the commands that the Pentagon has. You see, for each continent there is a command. Uh, there is uh, AFRICOM, uh, US uh, CENTCOM, there is uh, US UCOM, there is uh, US uh, SOUTHCOM. So basically, the, the, the whole world is covered. So the answer to the uh, question, who, who rules the world, you can almost get the hint here. Um, I'm here bringing another reference point. Uh, Eric Zeus uh, has an article called What the US Aristocracy Are Demanding. Uh, as we are speaking today, uh, in Chantilly, Virginia, just outside Washington, D.C., there is the Bilderberg Group meeting. It's from 1 to 4 <coughs> June this year. They meet every year. These are basically the most important people of the, the Western world. They're getting together. They call them uh, nation uh, government builders. I mean, they, they basically decide the fate of the world altogether. Uh, 
it's part of the what is known as the the deep state. There is a good review of this. Uh, it's called the true story of the Bilderberg Group and what they may be planning now. And uh, Stephen Lenman wrote a good review in the Global Research. Another reference is Full Spectrum Dominance, Totalitarian Democracy in the New World Order by William uh, Eggdahl. A lot of what is happening in the world today uh, comes from the project for the New American Century in 1997. After the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, the group that's called the neocons, neoconservatives, they decided that the U.S. now is the only superpower, and it should uh, act as that and basically uh, rule the world. Uh, therefore, they have this project for the New American Century. One of their first projects was to take over the Middle East, one country after another. You saw they invaded Afghanistan, then Iraq, and then the Libya, and they have plans to for Syria and Iran, but they are they're being having troubles there, and uh, they're being uh, uh, facing resistance. And according to the same project, they managed to raise the price of uh, to uh, to manipulate the production of of oil to lower the the price of oil. That is by their through their uh, Satellite countries like Saudi Arabia and uh, Qatar and the UAE, they brought down the price by overproduction. Their main aim was to hurt Russia, Iran, and Venezuela. And later on, we will be uh, covering Venezuela uh, in today's panel. I now have uh, another reference here top military spending nations in US dollars, in billions of dollars. You see the top of the chart in blue, that's the US. And then you see far from that number is China, Russia, and Saudi Arabia. As you just know, Saudi Arabia just bought more weapons from Trump. So that's still the valid uh, uh, record that Saudi Arabia is just behind uh, Russia. But you see, none of them are anything close to what the US has. But uh, they constantly talk about the threat from Russia and China. But you need to look and see the facts. These are the uh, documented facts that what's the military budget of these countries. I have more on this topic. Here's the defense expenditure per capita. If you divide by population of the countries, again, US wins again by a high margin. Then there is NATO minus US, and then Russia, Middle East, non-NATO, Europe, and so forth. So these are what is the true uh, danger in the world that Another comparison number is an example. Afghanistan war versus world military spending. US has spent more on the war in Afghanistan than any other country in the world spent in total on their military. Here's also more statistics cost of the war, number of Iraqis slaughtered, U.S. war and occupation is about one and a half million. A number of U.S. military personnel dying is about 5,000. And the other international occupation force, about three and a half thousand. The total cost of the war in Iraq and Afghanistan since 2001, it's one trillion and 700 billion. 682 million. That's that's the number. Okay. 
while the empire was busy in Iraq, Latin American countries came leftist and became independent one after another. They paid off their debts and cut their ties with IMF and World Bank. So a coalition was formed uh, named BRICS. Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa is the abbreviation of the BRICS. And this was a big blow to the, to the empire. And the empire could not uh, take it. Here is uh, some of the leaders of BRICS. So the empire had to strike back by, as I said, lowering the oil prices. And then they did these coups in, uh, in Ukraine and the crisis in Syria to stop Russia. The way it worked was that the uh, US likes to bankrupt Russia. But Russia sells gas through a pipeline to Ukraine. So because to stop that, US had to take over Ukraine. And alternatively, they want to pass a pipeline that, goes, that comes from the Middle East, UAE, by a pipeline through Syria to Europe. So therefore, they also have to control Syria. So Ukraine and Syria crises are related. They are both caused in order to make that uh, to Russia bankrupt. And you see now that they're having trouble with that. So they did the coup in Ukraine, and they caused crisis in uh, Syria. Now, Russia is one of the BRICs. The other one is China. The, to stop China, US tried to set up TPP. And you know that failed also. TPP did not pass uh, US Congress. Uh, also, uh, Trump didn't like it. Uh, then they went to uh, their backyard, which is Latin America, they did a series of soft coup d'etats uh, that now they're talking about corruption instead of democracy the ex as an excuse to intervene. So uh, you see that in Honduras, 2009, Paraguay, 2012, Argentina, 2015, Venezuela, you see it now today, actually. We'll talk about it later in the next uh, the two speakers. And in Brazil, you saw that they had the impeachment of uh, uh, Dilma Rousseff. Basically, uh, as a summary, the military industrial financial complex, they cannot tolerate independent nations. So they use different ways to um, control that. Often they use religion for divide and rule. You see now all this sectarianism you see in the Middle East, it didn't exist before, but it is created to have this constant conflict because they need a perpetual war and they need to have an enemy. You see all these Al-Qaeda, uh, ISIS, these are basically creation of the uh, US. I mean, the British had the hand in it before. They actually started this whole thing with India. Uh, when Gandhi went to them as for independence of India, <coughs> The British said, oh, which India are you talking about? There are five Indias. There is Indias of Sikhs, Indias of Muslims, Indias of Hindus, Baluchistan. I mean, they, they already had this divide and rule based on sectarianism. And Gandhi wanted to, they said, no, we want to have a secular India. But they didn't accept. So finally, there is a Pakistan, and uh, two Pakistans, and uh, one India. And that's what British wanted. And this whole strategy is now. Uh, copied by the U.S. using sectarianism. Now, in the, the Middle East, they keep saying, oh, Shia Sunni, Shia Sunni. Well, this didn't exist like that before. They were not at war. They, they try to make political issues into religious issues. So many people think that the issue in Palestine is religion, is Israel-Palestine, which is not. I mean, for years, they lived together, Jews and Muslims. Palestine is a colonization of the Europeans. 1948. This whole thing is a political uh, issue. Uh, we can talk about that later. That's a whole uh, separate talk. So they also need to have these endless perpetual wars to create new enemies. And they use mass <coughs> media for, for their propaganda to set the agenda and manufacture consent. Media is often now called as the fourth branch of the government. I mean, they, you see now stations uh, constantly. I mean, I 
if you turn around these days, CNN is all bashing Trump and, and the Fox is for Trump. And before that, it was uh, basically propaganda for militarism. When Iraq war appeared, they were cheerleaders for the invasion. They are not really into news anymore. They're just propaganda machines. I have some lists of tasks for progressives that what, so what can we do about all this? Uh, and so some of these ideas I have for, to oppose this is, uh, first of all, recognition of sovereignty of nations, sovereignty of nation states. That's what something it, they cannot tolerate, that nations are independent and they cannot be interfered with. <coughs> Another one's closure of foreign military bases, as I mentioned. U.S. has the largest number of military bases around the world. That shouldn't be uh, tolerated. Uh, the repeal of the veto power in the UN, uh, urging governments to sign the International Criminal Court, the ICC, declaring a no, no first strike policy, declaring a nuclear free world, prohibiting all arms sales to foreign nations. Um, Ban drone warfare. Uh, the previous uh, panel here was talking about drones that actually fly from Germany. And there's some uh, flyers here about the movement that's to stop these drones from uh, NATO to bomb the Middle East. Um, Oppose IMF World Bank to guarantee the rights of the uh, citizens of nations and their right to public ownership um, and control of their own uh, resources. Support the implementation of boycott, divestment, and sanction, the BDS against Israel. That's uh, a main uh, initiative right now that uh, it is compared to what uh, worked against the apartheid regime of South Africa. Now to suggest that if uh, countries can boycott Israel in the same way, they can achieve the same result. And dismantling the wall in the West Bank. Um, and the right of return for Palestinian refugees. You see, uh, if anyone is Jewish, like let's say from uh, New York, they're automatically Israeli citizen, they give a land, they're given a land in the occupied territory, in the settlements, they can go live there. But if you are a Palestinian born in Palestine and you're in refugee camp, you can never go back. So this is double standard. That's why it's an apartheid state. That's a whole uh, topic by itself, whole different discussion. So the bottom line is capitalism, <coughs> their work has caused a global wealth inequality. And here I have a short clip to, to end my talk. People are talking a lot about inequality these days, about the fact that the richest 1% have so much more than everybody else. But most of the focus seems to be on the United States. And it strikes me that the same story needs to be told about global inequality too. So I did some research, and this is what I found from reliable sources like the UN. It turns out that while the US is totally out of whack, things are actually way worse for the planet as a whole. Let's start with this graph. A perfectly even distribution of wealth among all living people, with everyone divided into five equal groups. Now, let's show how much each group actually has. Shocking, right? 80% of the world's people barely have any wealth. It's hard to even see them on the charts. Meanwhile, the richest 2%, they have more wealth than half of the rest of the world. Let's look at this chart another way. Let's take the whole world's population, all 7 billion of us, and reduce it to just a representative 100 individuals. Here they are, poorest people on the left, richest people on the right. Now let's show how the world's total wealth Roughly $223 trillion is distributed. The vast majority have practically nothing. Nothing with which to educate their children, nothing with which to pay for basic medicines. While the richest 1%, they've accumulated 43% of our world's wealth. The bottom 80%, meanwhile, that's 8 out of every 10 people, 
have just 6% between them. But even this doesn't really show how extreme things have become. The richest 300 people on Earth have the same wealth as the poorest 3 billion. So the number of people it takes to fill a mid-sized commercial aircraft have more wealth than the populations of India, China, the US, and Brazil combined. We can also see this difference geographically, with a huge and growing gap between a few rich places versus the majority of the world. For most of history, things were much more equal. 200 years ago, rich countries were only three times richer than poor countries. By the end of colonialism in the 1960s, they were 35 times richer. Today, they're about 80 times richer. Rich countries try to compensate for this by giving aid to poor countries, about $130 billion each year. That's a lot of money. So then why does the wealth gap keep getting bigger? One reason I've found is that large corporations are taking more than $900 billion out of poor countries each year through a form of tax avoidance called trade mispricing. On top of this, each year poor countries are paying about $600 billion in debt service to rich countries on loans that have already been paid off many times over. And then there's the money that poor countries lose from trade rules imposed by rich countries to get access to more resources and cheaper labor. Economists from the University of Massachusetts calculate that this costs poor countries about $500 billion a year. Altogether, that's more than $2 trillion that flows from some of the poorest parts of the world to the richest every year. Rich governments like to say they're helping poor countries develop, but who's developing who here? This makes me think that there's something wrong with the basic rules of the global economy. It can't be okay that the wealth of our planet is becoming so concentrated in the hands of such a tiny number of people. The only reasonable response, it seems to me, and our only hope, is to change the rules. Thank you. I will uh, now go to the second speaker on Skype. Yes, uh, this is uh, uh, Professor Yunus Penov, is a retired professor and dean of Surrey University, a political scientist. Uh, is be, we'll be talking on from Skype. Let me switch to. So yeah, okay. Okay, please, uh, uh, Professor Bernal, please, uh, please begin. Salutations and greetings to my friends and all the members of the audience. I would like in the next 15 minutes to focus on backgrounds of uh, infrastructure chaos and the features of it, characteristics of it, and finally conclusions. Uh, today, all the crises that we are witnessing throughout the world, including here in 
inside the United States. Confusion, disintegration, and many, many conflicting ideas and inability to come up with convincing answers to many, many questions. All of them, in my opinion, are byproduct of empire of chaos. Now, I, I would like to just talk about background of this chaos. Uh, from the time Buddhism entered into its last stage of development, monopoly Buddhism, at the beginning, at the end of 19th to beginning of 20th century. Chaos started, but it was always limited and controlled by the system. Unlike chaos increased during the Cold War era, and especially after the end of the Cold War, 1991 up to now, we see empire of chaos has increased all over the world. First, in many, many important geopolitical areas, and later on, from those political areas, it completely advanced in, in Europe, European countries, especially Western European countries, and now see signs of it in the United States. Uh, one of the features and characteristics contemporary empire of chaos. One of them is clash of civilizations which empire itself uh, implemented throughout the world which we used to call uh, we are calling semi-periphery or periphery world. Africa, Asia, Latin America and Oceania. So clash of civilizations, in the, as some of Huntington later on, his students like on the advanced the, uh, uh, what we mean by clash of civilizations, we mean in end of history, beginning modernism and modernity has come from end. We now bring into postmodernism. With within modernism, they need an astral on the one hand and national liberation movements on the other hand, they have come to an end. From now on, we will have clash of civilizations. And by then, that means by Obama, Huntington, and many other followers of this idea of clash of civilizations, to ask him, what are these civilizations in the world, the whole world, into nine major religious concepts and organizations and territories. And as you see, for example, many, many countries in Christians are not against Muslims, Muslims are against the Muslims, uh, are byproduct of this chaos. Because history tells us that a good number of these followers of these religious religions, they lived in peace and harmony for many, many years in the past. The answers in each of contemporary empire of chaos is quiet materialism. 
In other words, world system of capitalism is complete by triad imperialism. United States, EU, European Union, and Japan. Now we see not only chaos in the world, but chaos within the system. And another feature of uh, contemporary empire of chaos is geopolitical Germany. By waging visible and visible wars in five continents of the world. Today, we have many, many wars that every day we give to media, whether alternative media or mainstream media. We hear about these wars, the war in Afghanistan, war in Yemen, war in Libya. We hear these, about these wars every day, but there are more than 100 wars in especially Africa, Latin America, and Oceania, especially in the Greece, that we don't hear about them. There are invisible wars which are both byproduct of empire of chaos. My conclusion is that um, at the beginning, 100 years ago, if there was a chaos, that chaos was manageable and controlled by the system. The world system of capitalism was capable of controlling those chaos or chaotic situation, turmoils that they created in many, many countries. For example, in 1953, they overthrew democratic government, government of Musafik Iran. They created chaos, but that chaos was completely controlled by CIA, completely controlled by U.S. military advisors. But today, what do we see? We see that chaos is spreading the most geopolitical region of the world, which is the Middle East, or greater Middle East, into Europe. In the last, at least, years, we see signs of chaos in each one of those countries that never had chaotic conditions, turmoil. Manchester in Great Britain, or Nice in France, Berlin, Moscow, all of them are being completely infiltrated by chaotic <coughs> models and conditions. Uh, now, I believe that we are going to witness in the next year the spread of chaos into the belly of the head of the world system of capitalism, which is new, which is United States. Neo-fascism of Trump is the most important manifestation of this spread. So I will stop here and Thank you the Professor Benar. I now would like to invite our third speaker, Professor Francisco Dominguez. Uh, he is a former political refugee from Chile in the UK. He is now head of the Latin American Studies Research Group in Middlesex University in London, UK. Welcome. Thank you. Very Thank much. you very much, uh, Professor. I'll do it from here. Hello. Hello. Are you alive? <coughs> yes. Right.
what I want to do is to um, concentrate on the phenomenon of imperialism as, as manifested itself in Latin America. I'll cover the 20th century and then the 21st century and hopefully I'll see or explain or discuss where things I think are going. Um, we are in, the, in Latin America, we are at the backyard. The United States has literally influenced just about everything we have done since, I would say, 1834, when they began to expand towards the south. Um, they took Texas in the Texan-American War, 1834, 1838. Then they continued their expansion towards the south in a second war against Mexico in 1845-1848. And when they settled that war, which they won, the United States managed to get 50% of Mexican territory annexed into itself. All of these places, New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, and so on, used to be Mexican. You can tell by the names. People mention them Santa Fe, we call them Santa Fe, Santa Monica, Santa Monica, California is a Spanish name and so on. And in fact I'm aware that the name Gringo has a very bad origin. Do you know where it comes from? When the independence war was fought in the United States there were the red coats and the blue coats. So people were identified politically as well as militarily by the coat they were wearing. When the Texan rangers actually began to occupy Texas, they used to wear green coats. And they engaged in pillage, murder, assassination, burning, rape, literally everything. It was quite brutal. And the Mexicans, when they knew that they were coming, they said, let's run away because the gringos are coming. In other words, they couldn't pronounce green coats properly. And that's where the origin of the word comes from, gringo. So it's called, you know, in terms of our understanding of the phenomenon, this is where it comes from. They then continue to expand the Spanish-American War in Cuba, 1895, 1898. They occupied Cuba militarily from 1898 to 1902. And this was a war of liberation between Cuba and Spain. Cuba was a Spanish colony. If you look at any history book, it's, no, it's called as the Spanish-American War. Cuba does not exist in the title, even though it was fought in Cuban territory about Cuban independence. <laughs> so it makes me very nervous. <laughs> I always think of the CIA trying to do something nasty to me. Sound of the internet. I'm not worried about that. I survived Pinochet, so... <laughs> <laughs> no worry. No electronic device is going to impress me after that. <laughs> so, in 1898, when the United States was able to finally defeat Spain, which took them three months after the Cubans have done all the work, for three years, and the Spanish were about to be defeated, they forced a signature of a treaty that took place in Paris on the 10th of December 1898. They deliberately chose Paris to show the Europeans that we, the United States, have arrived. And in the signature, the US forced Spain to recognize the independence of Cuba. And they didn't allow a Cuban delegation to be part of that signature. And that's why it's called the Spanish-American War. And the United States, despite the fact that this was recognized, the Cuban independence was recognized, they continued to occupy the country militarily all the way from 1898 to 1902, 1903. And when they realized that Cubans said, look, you've been here long enough, and we want our country back, so you better go or else we're going to start the war against you. And the United States were very nervous about it. They decided to leave and they organized, drafted the constitution of the new Cuba, the independent Cuba. Literally, the United States drafted it. In the constitution of Cuba, 
they inserted an amendment, which is known as the Platt Amendment. In the Platt Amendment, he says that if Cuba, the new Cuban country, that is just emerging as an independent nation, were to jeopardize the hard achieved independence in any way, the United States had the right to intervene militarily. If Cuba were to sign a treaty to obtain credits from any other country except the United States, that would put the Cuban independence in jeopardy, the United States would be entitled to intervene. This was passed. It's shameful, if you think about it. It's shameful that the Creole oligarchy in Cuba accepted it, but it's shameful that it was inserted there. The name Platt actually comes from a name of a senator from Oregon, Neville Platt. That's, he introduced the amendment. And this constitution in Cuba was from 1903 all the way to 1959, all the way to Fidel. <coughs> By 1903, the constitution was ready. They were ready to leave, and they began to leave. But before they packed up, they told the Cubans, we don't trust you anyway. Even though we have your constitution, and we have this amendment that allows us legally, constitutionally, to invade your country whenever we want, which they did many times later on. They said, we want guarantees they're going to behave anyway, so therefore we want military bases. We want one in the Isle of Pines, which is today called the Isle of Youth, and we want another one in Guantanamo. The poor Cubans have to accept this, otherwise they would never leave. And as a result of it, these two treaties were signed in perpetuity. And the lawyers of the foreign policy establishment of the United States guaranteed that that treaty was signed in perpetuity in the following way. Only if the two parties agree to terminate the agreement, the perpetuity, then the treaty can be undone. If one of the parties refuses to accept, it cannot be done. And in consequence, the Cubans are ex stuck with the Guantanamo military base, naval base, in their own territory. It's unbelievable. Because there was a revolution in 1933-1934, which was really dramatic. Don't have time to go into the details. And it was quite nationalistic, so the United States decided they were going to withdraw from the Isle of Pines, which now is called the Isle of Youth military base, and they gave that up. They maintain one tunnel. So that gives you an idea of the necessity for the United States not only to control, to be hegemonic in the military sense, but also the military sense was the prelude, the precondition for them to actually control the country financially and economically. In 1903, the United States, the East Coast, for you will be the East Coast and the West Coast, were having difficulty because the country was growing quite dramatically. And they needed to make sure that it was, you know, as smooth trade as possible between the East Coast and the West Coast. And the communication system, the infrastructure was not brilliant at the time. And the quickest route, which made very, a lot of economic sense, was through the sea. So they went down all the way to South Florida, went down Nicaragua, and then all the way up to the other side. So the U.S. ruling class drew the conclusion correctly that geopolitically they needed a transoceanic waterway. And they looked at various places. They thought of Nicaragua actually to build it. It was too complicated possibly for many reasons. Then they decided to settle for Colombia. There was a little, you know, the narrowest part of the continent is exactly in that territory in Panama today, which was then part of Colombia. Panama as a country did not exist. In 1903, the United States government proposed to the Colombian government to be given the rights in a treaty to actually have the authority to build this waterway, to link up the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans in order to benefit the economic development of the United States. The government of Colombia said yes. Absolutely, because it involved constitutional matters and a treaty, they have to actually put forward the proposal to the Colombian parliament. 
the Colombian parliament rejected out of hand because, you know, national sovereignty was involved. And it would be very massively undermined. Because the proposal of the United States involved that they would have sovereignty over that territory of the U.S. themselves. <coughs> when the Colombian parliament rejected it, the United States instigated a separatist rebellion in Panama. And the Panamanians revolted in a democratic fashion in order to defend their regional right. And they proclaim a new government, a new country. They call it Panama. The first country in the world to recognize the new Republic of Panama was the United States. The Colombian government, when they learned about this, as any other government in the world would do, immediately sent the fleet to put it down, to put the rebellion down. Think about it. I don't want to be subversive, but imagine if any part of the United States were to do the same and say, we proclaim ourselves independent and want to separate ourselves from the United States, you can be sure that the Pentagon, the State Department, the various bodies of the United States will send all the necessary uh, equipment and people to make sure that they deal with that. Well, it happened once. It's called the Civil War. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so when the Colombian fleet are up there, what did they encounter? The U.S. fleet. They were there saying, we are protecting this, we are not allowing you to. If you enter into war with Panama, you entered into war with us. Colombia had to accept it. What was the first action of the new republic called Panama? Was to sign the treaty with the United States in order to build the Panama Canal. And the Panama Canal was built. Was, the wor works began in 1903 and they ended up in 1914. So, the, 19th, the 20th century was a period dominated very heavily by, particularly in the Caribbean, by U.S. military intervention and expansion, which was quite dramatic. They invaded the Dominican Republic in 1916. They stayed there all the way to 1930, dominating the country militarily, being in charge of the finances and the economy of that country, being in charge of the customs system, absolutely everything. They claim, when you read the books, that they introduced a lot of improvements in sanitation and God knows what, you know, kill some mosquitoes, stuff like that. But the fact of the matter is, this country is actually social sovereignty for all that time. They invaded Haiti in 1915, and they stayed there all the way up to 1934, and so on. They, I, I think the country has been the most privileged <laughs> in receiving um, U.S. military invasions in Nicaragua. As far as I know, because I've read some research where Nicaragua has been invaded by the United States in the 20th century about 47 times, in various ways. 47? 47 times. Obviously, it depends how you measure them. Sometimes it's a few soldiers going for a week and then coming back. Sometimes it's, you know, staying there for a few years and so on. But all of them are aggression against the sovereignty of the nation. Um, so they, they began to control the whole region in this fashion throughout the 20th century. And when they began to lose control after 1959, particularly after the Cuban Revolution, when there were some serious attempts to actually democratize and you know, attempt a different alternative, the United States just crushed them through either military inventions or coup d'etat of the traditional fashion, such as the one in Chile, which is the most famous one. Um, they sort of pretty simple the script is you isolate the country very heavily, and since in the 20th century the United States control all the sources of credit, you can isolate the country financially, blockade it quite dramatically. Number one, Chile at the time had you know, was the main, the largest producer of copper in the world. And this was the period of the Vietnam War, so the price of copper was very high. And the Minister of Economics, Pedro Vuskovic, calculated the budget of 1972-1973, which the crucial years of the Allende government, on the basis of a price of copper very high. The United States threw its copper reserves into the world market, 
deliberately in order to make the price of copper plummet, which it did happen. As a result of that, messed up our budget completely. And in consequence of this, what we had was terrible economic complications. This was coupled with a massive, intense destabilization program, which involved the assassination of people. I was there, I remember, holding basic necessities, everything disappeared, food, you know, edibles, milk, bread, wheat, just about everything, edible oil, was, toothpaste, it was impossible to obtain. I remember people have queue up for hours and hours and then. The whole idea was to actually punish the social base of the government, the political base of the government, you know, to undermine it, so as to really have create the condition to pounds. I remember at that time, literally every single, every two days, every two days, regularly, particularly in 1972, 73, the, the amount of bombs that went off, you know, the railway system was bombed, electricity pilots were bombed, literally throughout the day, sometimes days and weeks, and then bombs after bombs after bombs, until they decided to go for the kill, which was on the 11th of September, 1973. They just attacked the military pilots bombing with hogger hunters. I was around, actually, at the time. I remember vividly. The president called in the morning and said, come to defend the government. We're all impetuously young people without thinking too much. Just run to the presidential palace in the center of town. And it was caught on top already by the military, surrounded by tanks, soldiers of every kind, absolutely everyone. You could see it from a certain distance. And I remember from that distance, the Hawker Hunters flew over the presidential palace, went to the walls of the mountains, the Andes, came back around and went straight in the palace and bombed the palace with rockets. And the ground shook under your feet. I will never forget it. <laughs> again <coughs> and again and again. And our president was inside. You could see the flames coming out from the palace. It was absolutely horrific. Um, then I realized it was quite dangerous to stay there. So I walked towards the north of the city. I crossed the Mapocho River over the bridge. And I remember as I was walking across the bridge, I saw the river carrying corpses of young people that had been killed already and throwing, being thrown overboard, you know, being floating away. They assassinated ministers on the spot. They s bombed the headquarters of left-wing political parties. They closed down all the television channels, radio station networks. Many of them were bombed <coughs> by tanks. People who were inside were shot on the spot, executed. And I remember by what about one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, in the, in the afternoon, because the coup d'etat began at five o'clock in the morning, these four military guys came on television and told us they were the government. And they said, decree number one, nobody can move. They suspended elections indefinitely. They suspended the operation of all political parties forever. They suspended the operations of all social organizations such as trade unions forever, and so on and so forth. They take the ship, had a right. And a horrible dictatorial block descended over the country. And they proceeded to implement the most horrible neoliberal program ever. There was no opposition. And regularly, these four guys, military personnel, officers, generals, and so on, would appear on television saying that these were the words they used. If you were to resist in any shape or form, any of the actions of the military forces that are doing in order to save the nation, you will be executed on the spot. This is the phrase they use all the time. You will be executed on the spot. And I remember you started to receive phone calls saying, by the way, do you know so-and-so, your friend that was working active in this trade union has been just been shot and is dead. And then you go another phone call from somebody else. Do you remember that guy who was working in that particular place? And it was like this. In 17 years, the Pinochet military dictatorship actually assassinated 5,000 people. It's an awful lot. 
But this was the model then. The military dictatorship in Chile, the coup d'etat of that type, brutal, you know, with the military, was followed by the military dictatorship of the coup d'etat in Uruguay in 1974. Then by another one in Argentina in 1975. A similar one had taken place in Peru in 1975, and so on. And, if, and the whole region was dominated by extremely authoritarian governments and, you know, in many cases, pretty much like military dictatorships. And I just want to focus on this in order to let you know what was the strategy behind it. First, some of the key figures. Chile was a picnic for only 5,000. In Argentina, in six years of military dictatorship, they assassinated 32,000. Clearly, the Argentinians are much more efficient than the Chilean military. In six years, they managed to assassinate many more people. If you keep looking at the rest of the continent, as part of the same authoritarian wave in the, in the whole region. Um, in Nicaragua, when the FSLN took over in 79, all the way to 1990, when the United States unleashed a war of attrition against them, which was really horrific, 10 years of nasty counter-revolutionary activity, which is what they are trying to do with Venezuela now. The number of people that were assassinated was 50,000. And when you talk to Nicaraguans, they say, well, actually, that's an underestimate because if you take it account X, Y, and Z, it's a bit bigger, but 50,000 is quite a figure for a decade. In El Salvador, where the movement was disgusted with the oppression, the peasants particularly, the oppression and the exploitation and the brutality to which they were subjected to, they revolted. And they engaged in a civil war that lasted 10 years, approximately 1980 to 1990. And in El Salvador, 80,000 people were assassinated. These were assassinated by death squads that were trained and financed by people over here. 80,000. Think about it. How many you have to, you know, this is a killing machine. The people go out in the morning, 5 o'clock. They have a list, right? How many is 80,000 per year is? 80,000 in 10 years is 8,000 per year? How many it is per month? How many it is per week? How many it is per day? So it's a killing machine that is deliberately in, in cold blood, just assassinating people, literally as a means machine. In Guatemala, next door, in the same decade, the number of people that were assassinated was 120,000. Exactly the same method. And in Peru, in the so-called war against terrorism that lasted 10 years in the same period, same decade, 60,000 people were assassinated. This was the precondition for the neoliberal wave that they implemented in the whole region. The consequences of this in socioeconomic terms were unbelievable, horrible, absolutely horrible. By 1990, you know, one of the moments of the height of neoliberalism in Latin America. According to the Economic Commission for Latin America, the level of poverty in the region as a whole was 48%. That is to say, 48% of the population of the whole region was living below the poverty line. This is like 220,000, 220 million people. By 2004, that is to say, 14 years after 1990. By 2004, Chavez in Venezuela had been elected in 1998. And a few of the social missions began to be implemented. By 2004, Lula in Brazil had been elected already in 2003, and something was began to be done. But still not much, because it was just the beginning. By 2004, according to the same Economic Commission for Latin America, in that year, in 2004, the level of poverty was 44%, had fallen only by 4%. And at that time, the number of people that were living in poverty was 227 million. 
Now, if you look at what happened between 2004 and 2015, that is to say when the left-wing governments really began to apply policies, Evo Morales in Bolivia, you know, Chavez in Venezuela, the Kirchner in Argentina, Lula in Brazil, and so on. By 2015, 2016, the level of poverty, according to the same Economic Commission for Latin America, which I quote all the time because it's the best figures available around the place, was in the region of 26%. That is to say, something like 100 million people have been taken out of poverty in only, I would say, about eight years of, you know, anti-neoliberal policies. In Brazil alone, in about five years of the Lula government, 40 million people were taken out of poverty. <coughs> 40 million people. No government has done so much for that country in the whole constitutional history of that country. There's no question about it. <coughs> so, if you were to look at these figures only in terms of, you know, whole the statistics, you wouldn't get the full picture. Because social inclusion, which was part and parcel of the policy of poverty eradication involved, including groups of people with their rights that never existed before, literally in constitutional legal terms. Just to give you an example, I was delighted to go to Bolivia. I've been there a few times. And I remember we were watching national television. And suddenly I realized I don't understand a word of what they're saying. It's quite loud, you know, in the hotel near the presidential palace. And the reason why I don't understand the word of it is because it's in Quechua. It's in the indigenous language. It's the official national television in the language of the indigenous population with Spanish subtitles. That's amazing. In Bolivia, there are 39 official languages. Spanish is one of them. So in other words, there is a reverse of 500 years of colonialist racism that's been overturned quite dramatically. The proportion of the population of Bolivia, which is indigenous, 65 percent. Morales, in one address that he gave at the United Nations, not too long ago, he told the United Nations General Assembly that he remembered that when he was young and his mother took him, took him with her, to go to the center of town, she would avoid certain streets in the capital city because Indians you know, were not supposed to be there. And she would go around various places in order to... In other words, there was a sort of really dramatic existing racism. So the United States began to lose their grip. There was living governments, there were living governments in Argentina, in Brazil, in Uruguay, and so on. All of this had consequences in terms of, you know, the United States losing its position. S governments nationalized things, which were amazing. It was not supposed to happen, but they did. Telecommunications in Venezuela, still electricity. Uh, I can go on, but I just want to give you one anecdote to illustrate the point that I ha don't have enough time to tell you in detail. I was privileged to visit Bolivia with a British trade union delegation. They asked me to go there with, um, they asked me to go there, you know, as a sort of political advisor as well as translator. And we met Morales. And we talked to him for about 45 minutes. And that was fantastic, you know, really interesting. I translated for him. And, but I think the most interesting meeting we had was the, with the Minister of Energy. You know, the person in charge of the energy industry in the country. And he told us that he had been a trade union organizer, trade union official. And he said, I've been in and out of the country, in exile as well as back whenever things change. And I've been in and out of prison several times as well. And look at it, he said, now I'm the minister. So we asked him, what is the main problem that you, you know, as a country minister face? He said, well, the problem we face is that we produce gas in large quantities and multinational companies are extracting it, and they are paying very little taxes. How much are they paying, Minister? He said, they are paying 1% of taxation, which we think is very low. So what have you done, Minister? He said, well, we increased it. Could you tell us to how much? He said, we increased it from 1% to 85%. We in the delegation nearly fell off the chairs. 
And when I translated to them, the delegation was say, Francisco, your translation skills are very bad. You must have got that wrong. So I said to the minister, they don't believe it. So I asked him to write it down. So he wrote it down on a piece of paper, 85% that showed it to them. So I remember arguing, you know, physicianly with the, with the minister and I said, Minister, don't you think that's irresponsible? After all, Bolivia is a very poor country. And it means all the foreign investment it can get by you taking such a harsh measure. You are going to drive them away. His response was absolutely beautiful. He said, yes, he said, we thought they would go, but they haven't. So we are discussing to increase it to 95%. <laughs> so that gave you an idea of, you know, how the United States was losing the grid. Military bases have been removed from Latin America. Ecuador did not renew the license of the U.S. military base in Manta. And they put enormous pressure on Rafael Correa, I remember, at the time. He told us, you know, himself. They, they said they used bullying first, and of course he wouldn't budge. So after intimidation, they tried something else. So they said, President, would there, there be any conditions under which you would consider? In other words, what's the price? And they were pleasantly surprised when Correa said, well, of course, there is a condition under which we'll accept you to, mantain, we'll accept to maintain your military base in, in Ecuador. The Americans said, you know, which one? And he said, well, since it's not a problem to have a foreign power military base in your territory, what we'd like to do is to accept yours, he said, is you can have your military base in Ecuador, provided that Ecuador can have a military base in the United States. And he said, by the way, we'd like to have it in Florida because it's warm. <laughs> of course, the conversations ended and the military base is gone. There were several military facilities in, in, uh, in Bolivia that have been closed down. Some of these facilities have been turned into becoming indigenous universities. For example, there is no U.S. military presence in Venezuela. There is no U.S. military presence in Brazil. And uh, now, with the counter reform, obviously, they are trying to get back to this. So, just before we get very quickly into the 21st century, what was achieved in that period of the, of the pink tide was absolutely dramatic. Had it not been for the economic crisis that hit our commodity producing economy so badly, which has affected us really dramatically, we would have continued with progress and regional integration and so on, out of which you know, we produce many institutions such as Telesur, Television of the South, such as Radio Sur, Radio of the South, such as the intention we have to produce the Bank of the South so that to ensure that the IMF and the World Bank were, had no influence over there, and so on, many other institutions, including things such as Operation Miracle, which involves is a joint medical program of Venezuela and Cuba by which people who are blind because they suffer from cataracts and similar eye ailments can actually be flown into Venezuela or Cuba to have operations to have their eyesight restored, which was introduced in May 2003, 2004. And ever since, four million such operations have been conducted, free of charge. And the free of, free of charge involves the people are being identified and being flown in with somebody who accompanies them from wherever they are into the place for the operation. The whole period of con convalescence is free of charge for both persons. And then they're flown back free of charge, four million. The United States could do that 100 times over. I was going, I was going, yeah. yeah. Do you know a guy called Sergio Teran? I'm sure you don't. A guy called Sergio Teran is a, was a Bolivian, a sergeant in the Bolivian army. He was the person who actually was given the order to fire the shot that killed, assassinated Che Guevara when he was captured back in 1967. He suffered from cataracts. He went to the program in Bolivia. He was accepted. He was treated. He was cured. And he was sent back. 
And people who are saying to the Cubans, how can you do this? I said, well, it's a patient. It's, you know, we are doctors. And it's a patient. We have to make sure that we cure him. In other words, the humanity of what we are trying to do is absolutely extraordinary. The problem is that economic crisis created the conditions for the United States and their friends and their allies to take advantage and capitalize on it. And we are, we are having really successes. Uh, they've tried several coups d'etat. You know, they attempted to break up Bolivia in 2008, break it up into two places, into two pieces. They had a successful coup d'etat in Honduras in 2009. They went to the house of the president. They kidnapped him. They put him in a plane, flew him into Costa Rica, left him in the tarmac in pajamas. Imagine, the president of the country is the tarmac of another country, and when the officials went to ask him, he said, who are you? He said, well, I'm the president of Honduras. What the hell are you doing in here in pajamas? So there was a coup d'etat. There was an attempted coup in 2010 in Ecuador. The president was kidnapped by sections of the police that were supposedly on strike. When there were forces sent to actually rescue the president, and he, the president was taken in a car, this is the presidential car, because of the melee, he happened to be sitting in the wrong seat, not where he always sits. The car, as he was driving away, got 14 bullets. And one of them was straight into his bodyguard, who was sitting where he normally sits, in the chest and died instantly. So, you know, they were prepared to go for the kill. They certainly had the coup d'etat in Paraguay in 2012. They tried a coup d'etat, a constitutional coup in Brazil. They shifted, you know, dramatically the situation geopolitically in the whole region by having Brazil on the other side. The jewel in the crown is Venezuela. And they're really going very hard at it. They're absolutely throwing everything at Venezuela, including the kitchen sink. Literally every single day is violence and violence and violence. And this is part and parcel of what they call the color revolutions, which involves a long-term planning and penetration of these societies through NGOs, through political parties, to funding all sorts of institutions, think tanks and so on, of every imaginable kind. Let me put it like this. I believe that myself I'm a competent political organizer. If you give me one-tenth of what the United States is given to some of these outfits, I can promise you what we are able to produce something very dramatic in terms of political organization, social movements, organized, you know, political education and so on. This is actually what is being done. In the case of Venezuela, between 2002 and 2013, the National Endowment for Democracy, the International Republican Institute, the National Democratic Institute, USAID, and so on. This is the sources that we know of. There are many others that we do not know and possibly haven't been accounted for yet. But in that period, the United States has channeled to opposition political parties, media outfits, um, NGOs, think tanks, you name it, $120 million. If you bring it to the scale of the UK, which is how I measure things, being living there, that would be the equivalent of $1 billion being given to hostile forces within the country by a hostile foreign power in order to overthrow the existing political arrangements. This is not acceptable and tolerated anywhere else, except, of course, when the United States does it against us. And I think it fits with the following. I'll, I'll finish with this. The United States is in very severe decline. And I, I, I hear some, sometimes people saying with this with British. I don't. It makes me extremely worried. I wish the United States did not decline. I also wish the United States did not treat us the way it does. I wish that stopped. But my concern is if the United States declines catastrophically as it is doing, it's going to generate political phenomenon that we're just beginning to see the manifestations of, which are extremely unsavory. 
And in his decline, the people who actually run the show, those who, are the, who have the power, might go crazy in order to try to maintain the former supremacy they used to have by resorting to just about anything. And I don't want to elaborate too much, but you think about it. It's extremely well. I hope that the decline is very gentle, very slow, and you know, as calm as possible because I'm very concerned that what they can do with this chop decline is very dramatic. Let me give you some figures and I'll finish with this. The United States, as it's presently constituted, is unviable. It cannot work. <coughs> it has a debt which is 110% of this GDP, and it keeps growing. The efficiency and productivity of the economy keeps going down, and the level of debt keeps going up. You see regularly discussions instigated by the president, particularly by President Obama, so that the Congress actually approve an increase in the ceiling of the debt. The United States GDP is about 17, 18 trillion dollars. The external debt or the, the public debt, the total debt that the United States has is in the region of 20 to 21 trillion. In other words, unpayable. If you were to pay it solidly, that means that the United States is going to have a period of austerity for the next 30 to 40 years. There is no other way. Unless the United States is able to obtain colonies somewhere out of which will extract extra profit in order to improve its finances, which is very unlikely. The United States heavily subsidizes its agricultural sector too much, which is unviable, sometimes to the tune of $500 million billion. If you go to any supermarket, certainly in Europe, you look for U.S. long grain rice. And it's cheaper than basmati rice from India. This is not possible. The cost of labor in the fields <coughs> of India are significantly lower than the cost of the production of rice <coughs> in the United States, except if you subsidize that very heavily. In other words, the United States is losing a competitive battle. If you take industry, technology, and so on, it's pretty much the same. <coughs> Obviously, these are levels of relativity. The level of military expenditure of the United States is insane. It's totally insane. It's unsustainable. <coughs> the United States has something like 800 military bases around the world. Each one of them is extremely costly. It's waging wars that is losing. Each one of them is extremely costly. It's very expensive. Sometimes people mistakenly measure the amount of profits that companies that participate in this village get out of it, which is true. But the nation doesn't, and that's the difference. The nation gets in debt in order to support the wars that benefit small companies you know, massively. And this is not viable as a nation's policy. So from that point of view, the United States has to follow, you know, if you were Donald, or if you were Barack, or if you were Hillary in the future, if that happens. I'm not advocating anything, so don't worry. You have to address this question. How do you address them? It's very unlikely that anybody in the United States is going to actually go for the reduction of military expenditure. It's very unlikely. You know, they, people call it deep state, but the state the operators of the United States will not tolerate it. <coughs> So there is only one option in order to reduce, to address the problem of fiscal crisis that the United States has, which is to reduce the standard of living of its population. It's got to attack its population, as it's never done before. That means that the consensus on which the United States has been based, you know, internationally, is breaking up. That's really what is going on. And this is taking place in the context of the rise of a new geopolitical reality in the world, particularly in the form of China. In the next two years, three years, China is going to be the largest economy. Let me finish with this point. The rate of growth of the U.S. economy is around 1% per year. I know that it's exaggerating claims in the media, but actually it's about 1% per year. 
the rate of growth of the Chinese economy is about 7% per year. If you just measure that arithmetically, purely arithmetically, the reason I say this is because 1% over the 1% last year and the 1% year is not the, the addition of 1 plus 1 plus 1. is a bit more, but just arithmetically, the U.S. in the next 10 years is going to grow by 10%. And the Chinese economy, arithmetically, in the next 10 years, is going to grow by 70%. Since 1978, all the way up to 2015, China has taken 755 million people out of poverty. It's the highest increase in standard of living of any country in the history of humanity. In this case, in the United States, the situation is going in the opposite direction. So something new is emerging and the old one is declining. If you look at the key ally of, Europe, of the United States, Europe, the level of indebtedness and the level of crisis that the European countries have is absolutely frightening. The UK is about 100% of its GDP. Ireland is about 130% of its GDP. Portugal is about 140% of its GDP. Greece is about 177% of its GDP. Japan is at 265 percent of the GDP. So if you take all of that together, Europe and the United States are going to have to go for a period of horrible, nasty austerity for the next 20 years, which is going to generate all sorts of political phenomenon. Whereas the alternative rising um, geopolitics that is emerging is going to do something entirely different. That's why Latin America is orienting itself toward China quite massively. So. If the Venezuelans are able to survive, they might enjoy the fruits of the new that is coming, but it's going to be very tough. So do not lose your hope because whatever they've been able to achieve in Argentina, particularly in Brazil, you can see they're not able to consolidate right-wing gains because the country in Brazil is going down the pan and it's imploding. Very soon Bra Argentina is next. So we, we survive, then go down, we survive a few more years, we'll be done. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. And uh, last but not least, the speaker is uh, Luz Maria Scara Hill, member of the Directorate of the Youth of the United Socialist Party of Venezuela and candidate to the Constituent Assembly. Well, well thank you very much for the introduction. Well, I'll try to manage to put Venezuela into the context. Thanks for, for the heading. Well, first of all, uh, the situation, as it, as it was mentioned before, we have a, a global general, generalized situation. We have a few countries that have stepped up and say, hey, we do not want your army here in my country. We do want peace. We do have oil, we do have gold, we have natural resources, but we want to be sovereign. So there have been se several countries that have established that into the United States, and that's the struggle we are facing right now. So the United States is uh, going down, unfortunately, very droply, and that has some consequences. Part of the consequences is that uh, the United Nations is not reliable anymore, as we may have seen in the case of Iran, for example, um, in the case of Syria, for example. Well, we cannot rely on an uh, international system anymore because there is a country that just don't mind at all. Whatever, the, the legal system, the international legal system, it's not reliable anymore. It's a matter of force. So right now we are facing force, we are facing media, we, ha we are facing population, we are facing weapons. We have all these different situations or, or all these different approaches of the, the generalized situation and there is the strategic. What have people decided to do, what have countries decided to do, to use it as a weapon to survive, to maintain sovereignty, and to gain sovereignty in several cases. So in the case of Venezuela, when Chavez arrived, he said, well, let's gain sovereignty, let's gain through, through the population. Let's, let's go for the population 
and he he said let's go to a national constituent assembly in 1999 so in 1999 we decided to to get a, our new constitution based on what the society is right now based on what we wanted based on sovereignty based on of the knowledge of what we had in that moment and uh, I want to be very precise about what we thought or well, what we had in that moment the photography of what we had in that moment because in, in that moment we didn't know we were the first uh, oil keeper in the world in that moment we didn't know we were one of the five gold keepers in the, wor in the world in that moment, we did know several things that we do not right now. So we included in our constitution several things. We include the, the natural resources, but we don't protect it as well as we would like to right now, for example. We didn't know that the global system will be a joke in the case of Iran, for example. We didn't know that the, the construction of different uh, bases will be done in Latin America, for example, the bases that have been done in, in Colombia, that are, of course, <coughs> a very dangerous to Venezuela. The case of Brazil, for example, that they are, they are trying to, to, to make new bases over there. So there are several things that we didn't know in that moment, but we did know that we were Bolivarian. We did know that we wanted sovereignty. We did not, we did know that we wanted equality, we did know that we wanted, we wanted happiness to the Venezuelan people, and we did know that the international system matters. We did know that the international solidarity matters, and we did know that the international relations matters a lot. So what we did as a country was, hey, let's, let's look who is equal to us who we could approach to be partners in this new struggle that we are doing. So we approached to Russia, we, had, we approached to China, we approached to Latin American countries. Well, we approached to those who may help us in the struggle, to are equal with us, to have some similarities <coughs> to us, that we could struggle together against this new situation of uh, uh, imperialism going down. and. All the, all the danger that it, that it includes. That's what we did in 1999, that we have, that's what we have been doing in these 18 years. So in these 18 years, of course, we have received some kicks from that imperialism. We have received a coup d'etat, we have received the strike, the national strike of our oil industry, which meant a lot of debt for us, even though that, well, the country paid because we respect the system, we, even though the system is not working very well, we respect it, and we understand that in our position we cannot not respect it, because we are not the United States, of course. So that's, that's more or less what we have been doing, but in the, in the meantime, inside the society, we have acknowledged what the people is, we have acknowledged the original population, we have acknowledged the workers, we have been organizing ourselves, we have acknowledged the, the women's struggles, we have acknowledged the students' importance of youth, we have acknowledged several things inside of our country that uh, have allowed us to maintain the people, the people happiness, but not only the people happiness, but also the people awareness of what's going on. So we have been doing two things at the same time. S let's say the international atmosphere, we have maintaining their international relations, we have maintaining the international awareness of what we have been doing, of what's, what is important to, to be done, the, the relations, the strategy. But at the same time, we have maintaining our path, our route, our objective, which is the happiness, which is the organization, which is uh, to achieve all the struggles that have been, I don't know, uh, existing inside of the society through all these years, even before uh, Hugo Chavez. So at this point of the, of, of, of the history, of the situation, we have a new society. We have a society that have lived, a, have to survive a coup d'etat. We have done something which is uh, remarkably uh, unexistent in the rest of the world, which is resist a coup d'etat. So it was a coup d'etat and the people, 
I'm not saying, of course, th there was help from the military sector, but the people, the people is the, the one that went there and confronted the situation. That was something out of the blue. So that took the imperialism, w what's going on here? Well, we, we cannot apply the same recipe that we have been doing all around the world. Well, uh, they, they, they said like, okay, le let's, change, let's change the book. Let me, see, let me see if I can find another book. So they, they try to look another book. Okay, let's say, let's try to make an impeachment, like in Brazil. Well, in the Constitution, there is no option of impeachment. Well, okay, that doesn't work. Let's try to make, uh, well, let's gain the National Assembly. They push with the media. They try to suffocate us as a population. They try to make exactly what they did in the Agenda Schiller. They suffocate the society, so the society is very, very heavily pressured, and they gain the, the National Assembly. Okay, let's do an amnesty. They, let's, let's try to make an amnesty law. Well, they made it so bad that even the United Nations couldn't support it. Because they, all, they, they say, like, uh, they made a list of the things that they were going to be for, forgiven. And they were like uh, drug dealers, they were having weapons, killing people. So not even the United Nations could, could say that. Even after Iran, even after what the United Nations have been looking at, at the world system, they couldn't pass the, the, this amnesty rule. They say, okay, please. Uh, try another one. Okay, so not impeachment, not the amnesty. The credibility of the National Assembly went down. They they try to apply on legal uh, strategies. Let's let let me try to explain this this special issue. When they go on won the National Assembly, our we have five powers. Special. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if you know about this, but. We have five powers in Venezuela, not only the traditional European ones, which are the legal, the executive, and uh, ejecutivo, legislativo, and judi judicial? Judicial. Judicial. judicial, judicial, but also we do have the moral or citizen power and the electoral power. Well, the electoral power, in the case of Venezuela, they say, look, they went, uh, they use illegal system to gain in one of the states, so three deputies have to be stopped. So they included them, and the Supreme, which would be the Supreme Tribunal said, well, once you include them, you cannot, you cannot uh, work. I mean, everything that you do is illegal because we already established that they cannot be part of the National Assembly because they were illegally, uh, they use illegal methods to win. To win. Uh, in, so when they decided to include them, they blocked themselves. So the Supreme Tribunal have always said, whenever to t you take them out, you are legal as well. There is no, no point of, of that. Well, they decided to maintain out of the law, to maintain themselves out of the law. And with this uh, amnesty, uh, am amnesty uh, law that they tried, and so, so many in t attempts to change what w we have been doing these 18 years, well, the society just don't mind anymore what they have been doing because they have been uh, trying things so crazily. They, they have been kicking the table so crazily that the people is like, okay, we, we don't follow your leadership anymore. We don't follow you anymore. So now there is this situation of suffocation in Venezuela economically, uh, in, in the media in general. There is this situation of lack of, of leadership at the opposition. And what they are trying to do? Make exactly the same thing that they are trying to make in Syria, for example. So let's play this book. Let's say, and you explain it very well. In the case of Venezuela, we don't have religious matter, so they didn't include that part because it doesn't apply. But let's say, let's say we have an internal problem that allowed us, as the United States of America, to go with our little troops 
and manage the situation and take care of the country that have the most, the, the biggest quantity of oil in the world, the one of the biggest quantity of, of gold in the world, that have water, oxygen, uh, coltan, I don't know if that that's the exact word as well in English. Uh, okay, coltan. So let's, let's try to make like a situation in which we can just go there and take care of the situation. Because Venezuela, before, it, it worked okay. Well, First and Second World War, we took care of the oil. We were the owners of the oil. But right now, we are having a situation all around the world, and they are sovereign. They are taking care of their oil, and we need that. So let's suffocate them. Let's put a pressure into the society. Let's try to, to make a kind of a civil war so we can just go and save the peace in that country. Well, as in 1999, we have, we have really, really good creativity. In, we include in our, in our constitution the National Constituent Assembly. So in 1999, the President Chavez knew that the National Constituent Assembly was not part of our legal system, of our legal, legal institution. So we had to ask the Supreme Court in that time, hey, can we make a referendum, a national referendum, so we can include the National Constituent Assembly into our legal system, so we can change the Constitution and put the basis of the sovereignty of what we want as a country or what we are as a country. In that time, the Supreme Court says, well, yeah, you can do a referendum to do that weird thing that you're asking for. Okay, let's do that. So that's why we do have our Constitution right now. But while we were writing the Constitution, we said, okay, now we won't have the same situation. We will include the National Constituent Assembly inside our Constitution. So it's not something that I will have to ask to see if I can include it in, in our legal system because it will be already included. So we have now three different ways of changing our Constitution in the case of needed, in the case of the society needing it. So we have the amendment, which is more or less the same thing as the United States. We have the reform, if you change several things, but not the core of the Constitution. And we have the National Constituent Assembly. You can use the National Constituent Assembly if you need it, because you need it. That's the main point of it, because you can change everything. Well, also, the Constitution said, what do you seek as a state? Well, as a state, one of the things that you seek is the peace, of course. If you are the state, one of the things you have to maintain is the peace. So it's a strict order in our Article 3 that our present chief of, sta of state have to seek the peace. So he said, okay, we try this way. We try dialogue. They don't want to sit. We try dialogue with those presidents of those countries that recognize the coup d'etat right away, such as Spain, well, the Kingdom of Spain. And they just don't, don't, don't want to sit at the table. Well, they ask for the Pope. The Pope sends someone. They still don't want to sit on the table. We need peace, not only because of the international situation, because also because of the society, the internal situation. Well, if they don't want to sit with the Pope, we cannot call God. It's, it would be very, very hard. Well, let's do something else. Let's, let's force them through a national constituent assembly to sit on the table and to say, OK, if you want to change the core, if you want to change the constitution, if you want to change it, sit. Sit with me. Come on. Let's maintain the peace. I don't want to use weapons, because I can use, as a state, weapons to control the situation. But in less than two hours, you will have the United States troops here. And that's something I'm, I cannot handle. And I know that. Um, and that's something that you know when it starts, but you don't know when it ends. So that's not an option. That's not an option if you believe in humanity. That's not an option if you believe in people. That's not an option if you care about your people and your country. 
That's just not an option. So let's see it. Let's propose a national constituent assembly. Since it's already at the constitution, you don't have to call for a referendum because it's already included and it says, do you have four ways to approach it to the National Constituent Assembly? First, the president. Second, the National Assembly itself, two quarters of it. Third, which they, the opposition mentioned that they wanted to do it in, in 2015, but since they have been denying the existence of the Constitution in 18 years, well, of course, the society, the opposition said, well, you have denied the existence of this constitution. You have said that this constitution doesn't exist. Now you are telling me that you are going to use it? It just doesn't fit. Of course, it didn't, it didn't go well, uh, politically speaking. So, and the fourth, the society, if you recall 15% of the people in script to, to vote, you can get the National Constitutional Assembly. So the president, the first option, he said, let's go to the electoral power, let's propose the National Constituent Assembly. Let's sit. Let's sit for two reasons. The first reason, we have to maintain peace. As we said before, we didn't have the capacity of fighting against the United States of America. I don't know, we could, we could ask. Actually, Bashar al-Assad have mentioned exactly the same things that they apply to Syria, besides the religious situation, is what is being applied to Venezuela. It's exactly the same script. It's nothing else. So be aware of. We cannot afford to have a civil war. We care about our, pe our people. We care about our, our kids. We care about our sovereignty, our history, our culture. And the second reason is because in these 18 years of sovereignty, in these 18 years of changing the world, in these 18 years in which we have seen how we can approach to China, we can approach to Russia, we can, uh, we can approach to the so-called Middle East, we can approach to other wars, other, other countries, and not only saying, yes, Mr. United States of America, in these 18 years, we have grown so much as society. We have acknowledged that we are part of the world and we are equals to the rest of the world. In these 18 years, we have grown as women. We have grown as workers. We have grown as original people. Original people I'm calling the so-called Indians. We have grown as a society in general. We have grown uh, at the knowledge of the importance of the youth. So the youth is not only a people, a bunch of people used to, to, to give something to do. No, the youth is, is the, the future of the country. The youth is the one that we are taking care of because they are going to build the basis for the continuing of the country. So we have grown so much as a society that this, this has to be grown just as we have grown. So this includes the participation of the society. But now we have to concrete it even better. So the participation of the society is very, very robusticized. I don't know if that's a word, but let's say very more strong, more, more specific and more strong. Solidified. Solidified would be. Thank you very much. So we have to solidify all the things that we have grown as a society, all these issues that ha we have been doing below this, the legal system, which are not included in the, con in the Constitution. I don't know, you, you know about the triangle and all of that stuff, I guess. So there are so many things that we have uh, developed from the, con from the Constitution in these 18 years. They have to be included into the constitutional level to be maintained and perpetuated here at the constitutional uh, level of the legal system. So those are the main two reasons in which we frame the call to the National Constituent Assembly. To the National Constituent Assembly, well, everyone can, can participate. 
The president has called specially the position. Please come, see it, participate with elections. Come on. You can tell whatever you want. You can do whatever you want. You can try whatever you want. Participate. Participate with something which is not weapons. Participate with something which is not frustrating people. Participate with something that is not damaging uh, public uh, property. Participate with something that is not damaging the society as you are doing right now. In just few parts in which the opposition governs. So right now, seven over more than 300 uh, municipalities are the ones that are being violent. But the rest of the world knows only of those seven. Just like in Syria at the beginning, where the people were in a really, really hard situation, well, they knew only that. They didn't know about the rest of the Syria until Syria became what it's right now. So that's the calling. Since our president is very smart, he said, OK, before we reach to that point, let's put a table in the middle and say, let's sit. And that's the situation right now in Venezuela. So more or less, we are having a response to the general international situation, which is a general international situation. Well, everything is changing. We are in a table in which the queen have, have lost a lot of power, and everything is changing. Now, it's not a matter of black and white. We have different colors in the table. It's not a matter of two queens, two kings. Come on, why do we have to have two queens and two kings? We could have multipolarity. We could have equality. We can all be just citizens, equals. So in this change of the situation in the world, in which there is some countries that were looked as, as nothing, as backyard, as periphery, in international uh, theories, this periphery country has became together and going for the quality together and saying, hey, we're changing the system. And of course, there is struggle back. Because the only way to maintain the center countries is by taking the money from the periphery, as we saw in the video. It's the only way. So we're struggling for equality inside Venezuela and outside. We are fighting two battles at the same time. And that's what we are doing. And that's part of the generalized international situation. Because Venezuela is only a really, really strong example. But it's only an example of what we have been doing in the rest of the world. And that's more or less what I was about to tell you. Thank you very much.